Before we get into our subject for today, I want to share a couple comments on last week and on all weeks going forward. One is, I tend to use a lot of big words. I don't do it on purpose, but I do do it a little bit on purpose. I think that there is value in being able to communicate with the church in the past. And in our generation, my generation especially, it's worse than yours for some of you, our literacy is going down tremendously. The number of words in our vocabulary has decreased tremendously. And because of that, we can't understand what the Christians who went before us said. They thought a whole lot of things were worth saying. They put it in writing, and we read it and go, are you a scientist or something? What is this, rocket science? So I will probably use some words that at some point you might not know a word. Don't feel bad about it. If I use a word you don't know, feel free, ask me what it means. I will make an effort not to throw too many words in that I think you don't know, because there's nothing more boring than listening to someone that you don't understand for week after week. Um, second thing, I wanted to address, last week we talked about why do theology, well why do theology this way? We're working through it systematically in an order that I'll, I'll explain the order another day, but we're doing it in an orderly way, going through different subjects. Why do it that way when you could go through books of the Bible or when you could do it any number of ways? And a very simple reason is the Proverbs talk about diligence. And doing it in an orderly way is important. Doing something every week is important. And going through it, theology, in a systematic way is just, I think it's a helpful discipline. And I'm just basing that off Proverbs, that there's a discipline in doing things in a diligent, orderly way, and that that's valuable in God's eyes. Last thing on last week, we, I said we're going through theology systematically. We're doing systematic theology. I defined that as systematic is a, as opposed to biblical theology. Biblical theology is when you figure out how a theme develops in the Bible, or you look at what a particular part of the Bible says about something. Systematic is you just take everything the Bible says and ask a question like, what does the Bible say about such and such? I'm going to broaden that a bit because systematic theology traditionally takes in a lot of other disciplines. It will include uh, what we call natural theology. What do you learn about God by looking around at the world? A philosophical theology. What do you learn about God just by sitting around and thinking? <laughs> I'm uh, paraphrasing what these things are for, of course. But systematic theology is making an effort at having a coherent, all-encompassing worldview based on the Bible. And so when you do theology, you often will take in things you learn from history, you'll take in things you learn from science, and you'll filter that through the Bible, and you're coming up with a full worldview that addresses everything. And obviously, we're not going to address everything. But I say that because today, as we talk about the existence of God, we will be looking at what the Bible says, but we'll also be looking at what the church has said to show that the Bible's reasonable. Questions on any of that before we move into our subject matter? All right. So, does God exist? What does the Bible teach? I think the answer at to the question is immediately obvious. We all know Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible never teaches at length that God exists. It's an assumption. Just like it doesn't teach that the universe exists. It doesn't need to be said. It's like teaching that man exists. We all know that people exist. We all know that our thoughts have exist. The Bible doesn't teach that marriage exists. We know it exists. And it does the same thing with God. It treats it as self-evident. And it, that much I think we, we know. But it goes a bit further than that. And I have found that this is shocking to even to Christians. It's appalling to non-believers, but I've had Christians get angry at me when I show them what the Bible teaches about the existence of God. Um, I want to go to a few passages to illustrate this. One will be Psalm 10. 
you're like me and your usual Bible is in reverse order, you'll have trouble finding Psalms. Psalm 10, in verse 4, it says, In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Now, this doesn't mean that wicked people are what we would call today atheists. There were no dogmatic atheists in the biblical times. There was nobody saying there's no such thing as the supernatural. What it means is this person lives as though there's no God. You see, as he goes on, look at um, verse 13. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, that's the same phrase, he says in his heart, you will not call to account. The idea is he's saying, there's no one to judge me. I can do what I want because there's no God. If there's a God, he's probably so big and mighty that he wouldn't care about little old me and what I'm doing in my life. In Genesis when you look at how they talk about the fear of the Lord, you remember Abraham, as he's traveling through, he says, there's no fear of the Lord in this place. What does he mean? Does he mean that they're not Christians? No, there were no Christians back then. What he means is, they're going to be cruel. They'll kill my wife because there's no rules. When Joseph shows mercy to his brothers, they don't know it's him. He says, I fear God, so do this and live. He gives them a chance because he's not cruel, but the way he expresses it is, I fear God. It's understood that if you believe there's a God, you'll watch what you do because there is a judgment coming. And people don't need to have biblical revelation to know that. When Abraham went out or, or and went to Abimelech and he went to Egypt and Gerar and all those places, there was no Bible. He didn't have a Bible, they didn't have a Bible, but there was an understanding that there's a God who made the universe and he will judge you for what you do wrong. And yet there are people who live as though there's no God who sees them. And yet in doing this, they are not living consistently within themselves. The way Paul puts it, and this is the other main passage we'll use, turn to Romans 1, is that they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I think that the reason people get upset when this is presented is because everyone they know would deny it. They would say otherwise. And we're pitting God's word against the world's word. Because the world says, uh, I don't believe in God. And God says, yes, you do. The atheists say, we don't believe in God. Well, as it turns out, God doesn't believe in atheists. He created us, and he didn't create us ignorant of his existence. Look at Romans 1, verse... We'll start in verse 18. We'll read this section and work through it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. There's a lot in there. You see... First, he calls their rejection of God. And this isn't denying the supernatural. This is just idolatry, the fact that they're going to other gods. He calls it a suppression of the truth and unrighteousness. It's not a morally neutral, this is just how they are, this is what they believe. It requires unrighteousness to go and worship gods other than the true God. And he says that it's plain to them, not just because it's obvious, but because God showed it to them. In creating the world, God created the world in such a way it ought to teach anyone with a brain that he created it. There was a... Um, has Barnabas Mann ever been here? You ever met him? You've read his textbook. We used it at uh, Second Year Miller, maybe? He was uh, living in Cambodia. He lived through the killing fields, one of the few who did. Before the... the when he was young, he was a Buddhist, and he became a communist. And he was sent as a communist spy to listen in on an evangelistic meeting. And he went in ready to catch them for anything. And the guy had a very simple message. He said, look at this wristwatch. It came together by chance. 
And it was so absurd, the idea that a wristwatch would come together by chance. He said, we all know that's not true. But it's far simpler than you and I are. So how could you think that we came together by chance in a world that seems perfectly designed to suit us? And that was all it took. That guy became a Christian. <laughs> he became an evangelist. Because it is rather, it is rather obvious. Even I was um, sharing the gospel with someone on the streets in uh, Newcastle. And I basically just said, look around. Obviously the world was created. And she said, yeah, but okay, maybe, but wouldn't it make more sense if lots of gods created it? And after a few minutes, she was like, okay, yeah, I mean, we know everybody believes in God in their heart. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And then he says there, without excuse. That's a hard pill to swallow if you want to believe what the world says. Because as people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, they don't say, we're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. They say, we're righteous, you're silly, and that's how it is. And we have a desire, I think a good desire, to believe people, to give them the benefit of the doubt. There will be people who will even say, I know God doesn't exist because he says, seek and you shall find. And I'm sure I've sought well and hard enough. I sincerely read the whole Bible. I went to seminary and, you know, I know every existent, argument for the existence of God off the top of my head. And um, I just don't find any of it compelling. And you have to pick God's words against theirs and say, well, let God be true and every man a liar. But it is a difficult doctrine. The Bible is teaching that everyone knows God exists and that God has left them without excuse. And it, the doctrine gets even harsher, even more difficult to swallow. So bear with me. As he goes on, he says, although they knew God, verse 21, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds, and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We'll stop there in our reading. Look back at verse 18, though. It says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. I had somebody once ask me. They were working through whether they wanted to be a Christian or not, and this passage bothered them. Well, the wrath of God's revealed, it says. Where? Where is it revealed? I don't see God's wrath coming out of heaven. How do I see it? Well, this is where you see it. In verse 24, therefore, God gave them up. You see, atheism and rejection of God, idolatry, and the sin that comes with it, whether it be the various forms of prostitution that came under older paganism or the many forms of perversion and even mass genocide that have come under communism and other rejections of God. It says here that God gave them up to impurity. The fact that people can become so evil, so committed to evil, that they call evil good and good evil, they hate everything beautiful and love everything awful, that itself is God's wrath that he would allow someone to become that hardened in their heart. On a, completely aside, just practically, there's nothing in this text that says, and I believe there's nothing in the Bible anywhere that would suggest that God is not allowed to harden whom he wills. It doesn't say God hardens whom he wills except such and such a group, except pastors, except anybody. When, you, when we run away from God, when we start denying his truth in our lives, once you give sin a foothold, you don't get to decide now how far that's going to go. Once you give in to sin, you're not the one ruling over it. It's ruling over you. And God can give you over. I think he does with Christians. Sometimes he'll give you over to a sin to teach you to repent. Like you give over to this sin because it didn't bother you that much. Well, now another sin that does bother you is the one that uh, suddenly you find prominent in your life. 
Questions on that? This is, I, I understand the biblical doctrine to be God exists and it's obvious, and it's so obvious that God judges people for not believing it. This doesn't mean that um, people know everything about God. There's nothing in creation that would teach you that Jesus died for your sins. That's why Paul says that God in his wisdom did not allow man's wisdom to ever figure out salvation. No, no one is able by their wisdom looking around at the world to figure out how to get saved. That's a later revelation and only comes through hearing. But seeing and looking around ought to tell you there's a God who will judge you for your sin. Does that make sense? Questions on that at all? Before we move into the philosophical and natural arguments that are most common? All right, then we will move out of my expertise area and on to things that the church has found interesting throughout the ages. The Bible teaches God exists. It teaches that it's obvious God exists. Um, it's very difficult to believe something you don't understand. And so through the ages, the church has sought to articulate what that means. How is it reasonable? How is it obvious that God exists? And you might think it's something all Christians have agreed on. Actually, Christians have disagreed on whether or not you can even prove God exists. And it's not just like one side is totally right and one's wrong there. It's not as simple as it might appear. What I want to do today is present to you the categories of arguments that are used most commonly and some examples of what I think are the strongest arguments. There's a few arguments that have been made over and over for hundreds of years that I think are stupid, and I'm not going to share them with you because I just don't find them convincing. But if you want to know about them, you know, come talk to me anytime. I'll never turn you away. There's basically two kinds of arguments used to prove or demonstrate God's existence, or to prove or demonstrate that it's obvious. One is, and these are going to be Latin terms, so bear with me, one is a priori arguments, and one is a posteriori arguments. Arguments that come before and arguments that come after. The arguments that come before are just using logic to show God must exist. Before you even look at the world, just using logic in your own mind, showing God must exist. I'll share two of them with you. Two a priori arguments. One is an argument from contingence. Do you know what contingence means? That something's dependent on something else? The argument runs like this. It's possible for something to exist. Everything that exists either exists necessarily as in it must exist by its nature, it couldn't possibly not exist, or contingently. It could exist or it could not. Its existence is dependent on something else. Everything that exists must be one of those two things. It's impossible that everything is contingently existent. Because if everything was contingently existent, then everything might not exist. Does that make sense? Like if, if this cup only exists because this exists, and this might not exist, well, then this might not exist too at any given moment. <laughs> Since everything has existed for as long as we can tell our whole lives, there must be something that has always existed, is necessarily existent, and will always exist. It would be impossible for two things to be eternally, always, necessarily existent, because they'd end up being the same thing. Therefore, there must be something that exists necessarily upon which everything else is contingent. That something must be unchangeable. Otherwise, it would change and everything would change. Now, that doesn't get you very close to a biblical concept of God, but it shows you there must be something. Another argument would be from the concept of eternity. And it basically runs like this. It is impossible for an actual infinity to exist. Imagine a playing cards with infinite number of cards in them. Now, if you take out all the red cards, how many do you have? And now if you put them, if you put all the red cards back in, how many do you have now? W once you start doing that, if you have infinity, you can't add more to it. 
You, you can't have more than infinity because otherwise the infinity wasn't really that infinite, was it? <laughs> now, the past is a series of events. If you go on backwards forever, when will you get to today? Right? You, you can't. It doesn't make any sense that you could. Therefore, there must be a beginning to time. There must be a beginning to this universe. You can't just go back forever or you'd never get to today. But we've got to today, so there must be a beginning of time. And that beginning of time must have been started by something. That lends it, leads into the next set of arguments, but I'll stop there for now. Are you following so far? Am I... Some people don't like this stuff. Some people love it. <laughs> I think there's a reason that the Bible um, doesn't make these arguments. There's a, a beauty in the way it just says, the heavens declare his glory. You don't really need more than that. And the Bible knows it. And God knows it. So that's all he gives you. But as humans, sometimes we find it encouraging when we look around and go, it makes sense. The more I think about it, the more it makes sense. So, questions so far? I, I think it's important that we don't get the idea here that this is something that we need to be remember and specifically and, and regurgitate. Yeah. Right. This is material that we can listen to, we can understand, okay, and then when we make the statement, that scripture says God exists, you know, or however you, you just said it in scripture, that we know that, yeah, we believe that, but at one time we heard an argument that yeah. also supported that. Like so because otherwise a person gets overwhelmed that we're gonna have this test at the end of our Bible study and we're yeah. gonna fail this lesson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no um right, I'm just saying I think it's important to understand that for sure. your material yeah. methods. I would say such arguments add nothing to our faith. Um, they can encourage our faith insofar as we realize the truth of what God said demonstrated in reality. And there is value. Paul makes arguments like this uh, in Acts 17, for example. Yeah, you worship an unknown God. And it's the same argument he's making in Romans. His argument is not to prove that God exists. He's presenting to them, you know God exists, and here's the problem. You didn't say thank you. He made you, and you didn't thank him. You thanked all these other gods, but you didn't thank the one who made you. Well, he's upset. <laughs> that's all he's saying. And that's a powerful argument in his time to the nations who all worship many gods. So the Bible does, at times, the apostles show they're willing to go down to the level of the non-believers to explain the gospel and show that even with what they know, they ought to believe the gospel. They ought to believe in God. But philosophy and natural theology are not the basis of any part of our faith. The Bible is the basis for all of it. There's nothing we're adding to it. There might be Catholics who disagree, but, you know, we'll disagree. Other questions? Moving on to a posteriori arguments, arguments after the fact, meaning arguments from looking around at the world in particular. I'll share a couple that are particularly famous. One is often called the cosmological argument. It's basically an argument from causes, efficient causes. It assumes when you look around, everything that happens, happens for a reason. Everything has a cause, and the cause has to be effective. It has to be efficient. It has to be big enough to produce the effect. You know, I can say, I want to change the world. I'm going to introduce new laws and everything's going to be better. And you'll look at me and go, you can't affect that. You're not a sufficient cause. You don't have that kind of power. Well, the universe is an effect. It, if we look at it, we assume that something must have brought it about. And so whatever caused it, must be very, very powerful. The, this has been most famously, or perhaps most popularly recently, explained by, you've probably heard of Dr. Oh, my, his name's slipping my mind. That's terrible. 
Help me out here, Craig. Craig. Craig, Dr. Craig. He's very yeah. famous. I don't, I'm amazed that his name slipped my mind. Anyway. Philosopher <laughs> or? Uh, He's a Christian Paul. apologist. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're only 24. Yeah. Well, I'm older than that, but, you know, still, I'm without excuse. Anyway, that's going to bother me. Anyway, <laughs> the things you, I should have brought notes. I didn't know I was going to forget that. Anyway, he presented it um, in a three-part way. He said, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. And it's amazing how many people have argued against each one of those statements. I was reading, I, this is why I can't believe I forgot his name, because I read an amazing article by him just recently. Craig Hunt? Nope. It would be a name you'd recognize. Like, you'd, la you'd all know his last name. I think. <laughs> you, anyway. <laughs> that bothers me. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Big Bang for a bit. <laughs> you all, I don't know how you imagine the Big Bang, but I just imagine it as an explosion and then suddenly everything exists. Uh, scientists talk about it more cleverly than that. And I think what they're saying makes some sense, but it still assumes that there's God. So I'm just going to assume they're right and then say, if they're right, there's a God. The Big Bang is based on, a Big Bang is just a derogative term made up to call it silly, but... Then they adopted it, like many terms. But they would call it a singularity. The idea is, if you assume Einstein's theory of general relativity, then it, we have evidence to suggest the universe is expanding. But that doesn't mean things are getting further apart. It just means they're expanding. Space itself is expanding. So it's expanding in a way that you can't possibly imagine. Everything's getting expanded and bigger, but not in a way that you could possibly notice as it happens. <laughs> Now, if it's expanding over time, then if you work your way backwards, you reason it must have all been compressed. And if you could go back infinitely, you would find it would be infinitely compressed. And if it was infinitely compressed, and space and time are linked according to Einstein, then at the moment it was infinitely compressed, nothing existed. Space and time didn't exist before that time. And so, if you could go back infinitely, you would find a finite point where space and time cease to exist. Before space and time exist, there is absolutely nothing. Now, scientists have a way of arguing that because it's possible that all of the energy in the universe balances itself out to a net zero, and always does, that you don't need a cause to create the universe. But that is misunderstanding what nothing means. If there is no space and no time, then there's, there's no um, energy to be balanced out. Balanced out energy isn't nothing. It's balanced out energy. Where did it come from? If there's no space and no time, there must be something to start everything. And that something must be a cause powerful enough and creative enough and orderly enough to make what we see around us. Questions on that one? Is it William Lane Craig? Yes. <laughs> Craig was the last thing. That's what was throwing me off. I felt like a William, but I couldn't figure out. I was like, what sounds like William? Bartholomew? No. <laughs> Other questions on that? If you're online, yes, it was William Lane Craig. I'm sure you've been laughing at me this whole time, online people. <laughs> what did you call that? They called it the Kalam argument. It, the reason is it um, it's actually originates as a Muslim argument. Is that, is that what you started with? You cause it, cosmological? Uh, cosmological. The Kalam is a form of cosmological. There's lots of different ways you can go about it. Uh, Thomas Aquinas gives five ways, and they were all basically the same, so I didn't feel like explaining. You could start with motion. Say it again, cosmo. Cosmological, from cosmos, meaning world, or universe in Greek. Logical, so study of the universe. 
Another one, as long as I'm throwing Greek words at you, is the teleological argument. Argument from purpose. I want to skip that one, though, because I, I'd rather talk about the moral argument. The argument from the moral law. I think this one, at least in my reading, has been best articulated by C.S. Lewis. Have you ever read Mere Christianity? Some of you? I think he presents the argument best in that book. The argument is basically that we all agree to moral laws. They're universal. And it's not, it's not like a law of physics. A law of physics is describing what's happening. And so when we, say, when we use the word law, we're actually... It's a figure of speech when we talk about the law of gravity. Because when a rock falls to the ground, it's not thinking, oh yeah, God told me to fall to the ground. It's just falling to the ground. We're using the word law to say, this is what always happens. We're just describing it. But the word law properly is about what ought to be. It's put in place by a lawgiver. I can have laws in my house and say the kids have to go to bed at such and such a time. Doesn't mean they always do, but that's the law. The moral laws that we have and attempt to live by in all cultures are not descriptions of what we do. It's what we ought to do. And now you can say it's all relative, and lots of people like to do that. They'll say, oh yeah, Hitler was fine, he just thought he was good, so he was in his mind, but we don't like him, and that's why we say he's bad. You will be, if you haven't noticed already, that's what people are saying now. They believe that everything is relative to the point that Hitler wasn't actually evil. And it used to be you could use Hitler as an example to say, well, surely you don't really believe that. I mean, look at Hitler. And now they go, so what? So what? It's all relative. What do you call that argument? Moral? Just the moral the, argument. Just the moral. Yep. Just the argument from the existence of our morality. The argument is that there are moral laws, therefore there must be a moral law giver. And regardless of how cultural you want to make it, there's variations on di different things are seen as good or bad, but you'll never find a culture that actually has totally different moral laws. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Imagine what that would look like. A, a country that had moral laws totally different from yours, where a man is celebrated for running away from battle. Yeah, there's no culture like that. Nobody celebrates selfishness. And anybody who says that they do will get upset with you as soon as you do something wrong. You hear it when people argue. Anytime you hear people argue about something, if one person makes an excuse, they're showing that they actually agree about the standard of right and wrong. If there was a right and wrong, you say I did wrong. No, I didn't. Well, that shows you agree that there's a wrong to be done. And I don't think you'll find an exception in the world. Everybody knows there's right and wrong. The proof of it in the Bible is shame. As soon as Adam and Eve ate from the fruit, their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. Everywhere in the world, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you felt shame at some time in your life. Why would that be unless there's an actual evil? If you're just doing the things that come naturally to you, and it's all natural. Why shame? Questions on that? We're about out of time. I've got one thing I could cover if, uh, if we think we can rush up, but we've got 10 minutes before service starts. You all look... I'll stay here until after service. Starts, <laughs> so <don't> <laughs> well, we won't do that. I'll cover one thing very quickly. Uh, just about the objections we're going to get today. I don't know. I suspect that many of us, myself included, would have a lot of difficulty keeping up with academics. What are philosophers saying these days? What are the scientists saying these days? There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. But regardless of whether or not we can keep up with it, it has an effect on what everyone around us believes. What the schools say, what the thinkers of our time think, trickles down until everybody believes it. The most cited academic, today if you look at articles on pretty much anything, there's one person who's been cited more than anybody else. One of the most influential people uh, today, he's not alive anymore, but he's still the most influential. His name's Michael Foucault. Have you heard of him? 
he um, was living during Nazi Germany, and he basically taught exactly what the serpent taught in the garden, that n true knowledge is attained through transgression. If you disobey, then you will find enlightenment. God knows on the day you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That was his worldview, and he lived it out. He believed that knowledge, in its essence, what knowledge is, is a means of oppression. The reason people feel guilt is not because they've done wrong, but because they've been told they've done wrong by people like the church, imposing morals on others. That all feelings of guilt comes from oppression, and that all knowledge is intrinsically oppressive. And that's all it is. It's not true or false. It's oppressive. And may the best oppressor win. And he lived it out. He lived a very um, promiscuous homosexual lifestyle, and he viewed it as, I want to break free from morality. I, I'm anti-moral. And his views on psychology, his views on language are, it's at a point where if you go into the human sciences today, you have to do everything through that grid. What has he said? You can't write a thesis and not ask, well, what did he say? And as you look around, though most people haven't heard of him, his ideas are prevalent. Knowledge is oppression. In the Bible, it's not. It's true. We have a different worldview. We believe what we see around us. We make sense of the world because God exists. And we have a worldview that allows us to believe in truth. But once you throw away God, you don't have a, any basis to believe that truth would exist. And it'll be a challenge to deal with. So, good luck. I'll be praying for you. Let's go to the church. <laughs>